Hear the word of the Lord from James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all, without reproach, and it will be given, will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers, its flower falls and its beauty perishes so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he bring us... Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Sojourn. Good morning. Peace be with you on this beautiful day. As we open God's word together, let's go before him again in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power. We thank you for the ways in which you use it to accomplish your will among your people and even drawing people unto yourself. And so today, as your word is revealed, as your gospel is proclaimed, I pray that you would do the very work for which you intend it in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. May we leave here in response to you, different people. And may we leave here together a changed community. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Out of every crisis, every tribulation, every disaster, mankind rises with some share of greater knowledge, of higher decency, of purer purpose. Franklin D. Roosevelt spoke these words in his acceptance speech at the Democratic National Convention in 1932. The United States were in the throes of the Great Depression and Roosevelt, then governor of New York, used this speech to inspire his party and promise a new deal for the American people. And Roosevelt would go on to win the election and serve four consecutive presidential terms and lead the country out of the the Great Depression. But are those words from his acceptance speech true? Does mankind always rise out of every crisis, tribulation, and disaster with some share of greater knowledge, or higher decency, or purer purpose? Can we even speak of humanity as having a monolithic response? Certainly some People will have such noble responses to trying times. Trials, and particularly severe ones like the Depression, bring out the best in some. 
But the laws of human nature and the evidence of history would suggest that they can also bring out the worst in others. While Roosevelt was calling people to the greater good, some Americans sensed a new opportunity for serious criminal activities like bootlegging and bank robbery and kidnapping. And crime rose significantly during the Depression. The optimism of humanism bends and breaks under the reality of humanity. It's hard for us to imagine how we would respond to a desperate situation like the Great Depression. And none of us have any idea what sort of historic challenges we might face in our own lifetime. But even if we never face a national or global calamity like the Great Depression, we can be, we can be certain that we will face trials of many kinds. National concerns, fears, and anxieties in an election year like this one might be at the top of your list. But there's also relational strife, social anxiety, loneliness, physical pain or illness, financial hardship, unemployment or underemployment, longing for a spouse or children or both, a difficult child, aging parents, unmet desires, general disappointment with the direction of your life. Each of these and plenty of other examples like them fall under the category of trials. And in this country of freedom, our tendency when we face trials is to do what we can to solve the problem, to remove the obstacle, to reduce the friction. As humans, we naturally and understandably avoid pain and we're resourceful enough oftentimes to fix the situation if it is possible to fix it. But what about when it's not possible? What about when we can't fix it? What about when the solution is not obvious? The global COVID pandemic revealed just how out of control we really are. But whether it's a difficult person, a dead end job, declining health, desperate finances, or a deadly pandemic, our God, the sovereign Lord of the universe, has a plan and a purpose for every single trial that we could ever face. We're starting a new series in the book of James this morning, and trials serve as a backdrop for the entire letter. James is writing to a group of fellow Jewish Christians who are enduring suffering for their faith, among other issues. And he opens the letter with our passage, James chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, which Dodds just read for us. And in this opening passage, he communicates this principle. Trials are a good test from God that require dependence on him so that we might find joy and wholeness in him. We're going to unpack each of these main words to draw principles in facing our trials, starting with joy and wholeness and working backwards, joy and wholeness, dependence, test, along with a brief specific address of money as a prominent provider of trials. This is going to be our outline. Before we start with our first principle of joy and wholeness, we need to read the opening verse to get a sense of the letter. So let's consider James chapter 1 together, starting with verse 1. He writes, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Now in the New Testament, there are three people that are named James, which is just the Greek uh, name for the Hebrew name Jacob. There's James, the son of Zebedee and the brother of John, one of Jesus' inner circle disciples. There's James, the son of Alphaeus, also called James the Lesser or James the Younger. He's another one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And then there's James, the son of Joseph and Mary and the brother of our Lord Jesus, who was the early leader of the church in Jerusalem after Peter moved on to start new churches elsewhere. And most evangelical scholars believe that this is the James who authored the letter, James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, despite his initial resistance to the idea of his brother as Messiah, this James eventually came to faith in Christ. He rose in prominence to prominence in the Jerusalem church, which was the very first Christian community which was composed largely of Messianic Jews or ethnic Jews who were followers of Jesus as Messiah. 
And during the 20 or so years that James was the leader of the Jerusalem church, he and his fellow Christians faced persecution at the hands of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And at the same time, they suffered a famine that devastated the region. And so James wrote this letter of wisdom, likely addressing a specific church or a group of churches outside of Israel during these specific difficult challenges. And he was regarded as a pillar and a peacemaker in the Jerusalem church. He was a man who led with wisdom and courage until his untimely death at the hands of the priestly establishment who killed him in AD 62 for following Jesus. And so if this James is indeed the author of the letter, then the date of his martyrdom means that this was one of the earliest books written in the New Testament canon. And if the author is the brother of Jesus and the leader of the Jerusalem church, it's important for us to notice how he refers to himself as he opens the letter. He describes himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't brag about his familial relationship to the Messiah, nor does he lay claim to his qualifications as one of the most prominent leaders in the early church. He simply refers to himself as a servant of Jesus. And this is how we who follow Jesus as well should view ourselves. Speaking of 12, uh, James is writing this letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. There were 12 tribes of Israel, and as the true and faithful Israel, Jesus chose 12 apostles to serve as the start of the church. And he's writing specifically to Jewish Christians who are ethnically Jewish but followers of Jesus. And they've been dispersed all over uh, the area surrounding Israel and beyond uh, because of Israel's expulsion from the land after being conquered by nations like Assyria and Babylon, and then later uh, they were occupied by nations like Rome. And though they are dispersed and facing persecution and oppression wherever they are, James has words of encouragement for his brothers and sisters starting with the genuine potential for blessing that their trials present. The very first principle that James impresses on these Jewish Christians as they suffer for their faith is that trials are capable of producing joy-filled wholeness in followers of Jesus. Look at verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, apart from our knowledge of God's word, this is not what we would naturally think as we were facing trials. Count it joy? No. Count it as pain. Count it as a reason to pout Count it as a reason for grumpiness, as an opportunity to complain. That's how we typically, naturally would view our trials. But the reason that we would have any of those responses is because we're failing to have the proper view of the role that trials play in the lives of Jesus' followers. Now, I feel like I personally could use a 60-minute sermon on these two verses alone. Uh, Not that I would preach it, but that I would receive it. I've needed to repent this week as I prepared this sermon. I've never faced as many disruptions as a pastor as I did in this week in preparing for the start of James. I've never preached a sermon where I was as behind in my preparation as I was this week. And even now, my temptation is to lay out for you a laundry list of all the things that went wrong so that I can complain to you We're really good at complaining, aren't we? We're good at telling other people about all the reasons for our bad attitude. And I say all this recognizing that the trials that I face this week pale in comparison to some of the things that you are dealing with right now. They're nowhere near the suffering that our fellow Christians are enduring in countries right now like Pakistan or Sudan or Myanmar or Afghanistan or even the the original recipients of this letter, the suffering that they were faced. But trials are trials. No matter when we face them or how we face them, trials are real to us. 
And whatever our trials might be, our main problem often starts with how we view them in our minds and in our hearts, our attitude. And that's why James opens the letter without even a pace, telling his readers to count it joy when we face various trials. Notice that he doesn't say, consider yourself happy. That would be a totally different exhortation because happiness is contingent upon our circumstances. Happiness is an agreeable feeling or condition of the soul arising from good fortune or propitious happening of any kind. Happiness is circumstantial. It just happens. It's passive. It's a response. You cannot fake it. You can't produce it. When you're happy, you know it. And sometimes you clap your hands. <laughs> joy, on the other hand, is a choice. Joy is learned. Joy is hard work. Joy is a spirit-wrought act of the will. It is a product or a fruit of the spirit living in the hearts of believers. Joy is a deep, resolute settlement or acceptance that whatever you have, this moment, your day, your life is from God and therefore it is is good. That is joy. Joy is a spiritual commitment to accept anything and everything as coming from the sovereign Lord and his genuine care for us. When we face trials, when we fight for this perspective, this deep-seated joy has a product. James tells us that we know, or at least we're supposed to know, that trials, when properly and joyfully understood, function as a test of our faith. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And when our faith is tested, it will produce steadfastness or endurance despite our trials, despite our troubles, despite our suffering. And if you are committed to this joyful perspective toward whatever the Lord brings your way, and if you persist, and if you endure it, with joy, God will produce in you what he describes here as perfection, completion, lacking in nothing. I've called this joy-filled wholeness. Now, it's hard to know whether James is referring specifically to ultimate perfection and completion in the believer when we go home to him or he returns. Certainly, that's true. Or if he's referring to our lives here and now. Either way, he's describing the end goal and everything in between. Wholeness, completeness, with integrity, undamaged, intact. These are the words that should describe us and our faith. When we count our trials as joy and when we endure them with God's help. So think of the issues that have been troubling you most in the recent days or weeks or months, or even years. And the question that comes to us from God's word is, have you been counting those trials as joy? Have you been viewing them as an opportunity to develop steadfastness? Have you been using them as an opportunity to grow endurance? Have you been using them as a chance to worship God and thank him for what he has given you? instead of complaining about what he hasn't. Trials, when viewed properly, have the potential, the real, genuine potential, to produce joy-filled wholeness in the life of the Christian. And they also force our dependence on God. Let's look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now before I address these particular verses, I want to pause and just mention something that I think will help us as we study the book of James together. James is immensely practical because he's drawing heavily on the book of Proverbs and Jesus' proverbial teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. And we might read these 18 verses that open this letter and feel really like there could be five different sermons here. 
Uh, James addresses trials and then wisdom and then the rich versus the poor and gifts from above. And, and each of these proverbs of sorts can feel disconnected from the last. That, that will be a common feeling that we will have as we read through, the, through James together. But this whole passage that we're reading together this morning is about trials. He opens with a discussion of trials right in verse 2, and then he, he opens the very last section of this passage in verse 12 with, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. James is not bouncing around aimlessly. He's looking at one topic, and in this case, it's trials, and he's addressing it from a couple different angles, each with its own type of proverb. And this is probably why I was so drawn to James as a new Christian in my teens. Uh, the verses packed a punch. They were easy to remember. And the proverbial principle that, that James reveals in these verses is that trials force our dependence upon God. They produce joy-filled wholeness and they force our dependence on God. Trials, by their very definition, are trying circumstances. They are difficult. We don't always know how to handle them. Or perhaps I should say, we never really know how to handle them. Because if we did, then they wouldn't be trials. If we had a quick answer for them or a solution to them, there would be no need for James to write about them. But he encourages his fellow Christian, when they lack wisdom on how to handle a particular trial, to ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. The word translated generously here means simply, sincerely, above board, in a straightforward manner. God will answer requests for wisdom in difficult circumstances simply and succinctly. But James then adds a caveat to this. If God is simple and straightforward in answering our prayers for wisdom, we should be simple and straightforward in asking for it. We should ask in faith. We should not ask in a doubting manner or double-minded. And this is referring to our temptation to go back and forth between relying on our own abilities and relying on God's wisdom. And when we do that, when we go back and forth between faith and faithlessness, we're like a wave tossed back and forth between the desire to trust God and relying on our own self-confidence to solve the problem on our own. But James says, don't do this. Don't ask for his help when you aren't sure you want to take it. Don't expect God to provide guidance and clarity when you're treating him like nothing more than a genie in a bottle. Don't expect God to answer your prayer with his unending supply of divine wisdom when you're content to rely on your own limited human understanding. But what do we do if we're struggling with faith to believe that he can and will provide the wisdom that we need? Is that what he's talking about here? I don't think that's what he's talking about. If, if you're in that case where you're believing and struggling to believe continually, I would encourage the prayer of the desperate dad in Mark 9, 24. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Acknowledge the struggle and press on with your request with even the smallest mustard seed of faith, believing that God can and will provide the wisdom you need so that, so that you can endure the trial that you're facing that's come from him. I will say that this is probably one of the most helpful passages for me that I've read in, in recent time because I'm terribly and unashamedly, or ashamedly, not unashamedly, I'm terribly and ashamedly prone to self-reliance. There was a time when this wasn't a verse that I relied on or turned to because I didn't realize just how self-reliant I was. And then I married Ashley. And early in our marriage, when I would find myself in situations where I didn't know what to do, where I didn't have a solution to the problem that I was facing, she would gently remind me of James 1. I also served on a pastoral staff where one of the pastors would frequently remind us when we faced an issue in ministry that we needed to stop right where we were and pray and ask for God's wisdom so that we might know how we could solve it. When you face trials of many kinds, do you turn to God for wisdom? Are you quick to rely on him for solutions? Or do you struggle like I struggle with spending all this time noodling out your problem on your own 
instead of asking God for his never-ending supply of wisdom, that he is eager to give when we pray in faith. These have been incredibly convicting questions for me as I think about them. Trials produce joy-filled wholeness. Trials force our dependence on God for wisdom. And then in verses 9 through 11, James provides a brief example where he, he gives one of the most common trials that those are difficulties that are associated with money. And we might be tempted to think that trials only apply to people who lack money. But he goes on to demonstrate that trials affect the rich and the poor alike. They each face their own unique difficulties as as it relates to money. Look at verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Money plays a unique role in the heart of humanity. And poor people are tempted to see it as a solution to their problems. And rich people are tempted to find their safety and security and significance in it. And this is not just some neutral view of money. Jesus is emphasizing the incredible temptation present for all of humanity to worship money, for it to be a source of devotion, to give the place in our heart that only belongs to the Lord, to give it instead to money or the desire for wealth to allow it to have a stranglehold on our heart that chokes out Godward dependence and generous stewardship. It doesn't matter whether you're rich, poor, or somewhere in between. The Bible is clear that when it comes to money, temptations abound. James first addresses the poor or lowly brother. Let him boast or glory or take pride in his exaltation. The world might treat you as less than, but rest in the fact that one day you will be exalted. You are now presently seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You have an inheritance that will never fade. This is the encouragement that James gives to the poor Christian. He doesn't tell them how to get richer. He doesn't offer any money-making schemes. He doesn't promise financial prosperity for all who are followers of Jesus. He does none of those things. He tells the poor brother or sister that they will be exalted. And he says this hoping that it will change whatever hope that they might be placing in their present state in money. There is no security in money. Just think of those who were rich in early 1929, the year that the Depression hit. Because if they were trusting in their bank account, they were left with nothing to stand on and their foundation was destroyed. James instructs the lowly, the poor brother or sister to hope in the Lord, to trust in the Lord, to wait on the Lord. Exaltation is coming, even if wealth in this world is not. And if we believe this, it changes our perspective. Then James turns to the rich man If the trial of the poor is wishing that they had more money, the trial of the wealthy is putting too much dependence on the money that they already have. And so while the lowly man is to boast in his exaltation, the rich man should boast or glory or take pride in his humiliation. That word translated in English feels too strong uh, to me uh, because in Greek it really simply means to be brought low, to experience a reversal of fortunes. And the graphic biblical imagery that James provides emphasizes life and its, and, and its wealth's temporary nature because grass withers, flowers fall, beauty perishes, and so will the rich man fade. Death is the great leveler. Wealth is here today and it's gone tomorrow. And whatever exaltation rich people experience in this life by nature of how much money they have will disappear in the life to come. And so the rich man should recognize this now 
and identify with his lowly Christian brothers and sisters now by embracing a posture of humility. Because if one day rich people will no longer have the advantages of their money, then James is telling they should view their money and live as if that were already true now. Embrace the humiliation of being in Christ now because you can't take it with you. God won't care how much money you had in your investment accounts when you die. But he will care what sort of devotion you gave to money in your heart. He will care how much you thought about it. He will care how much you maximized it for his kingdom purposes. James isn't saying that you can't be rich and be a Christian. He's not saying that. But he is telling rich Christians to boast in their humility now. He's calling us to a radical, generous, selfless, countercultural view of and use of our money and our possessions and our earthly pleasures because we cannot take it with us. We can't. Unless we know that life is a vapor, we will continue to live life with an ephemeral mindset instead of eternal mindset. Listen to what prominent writer and orator Robert Ingersoll had to say about Abraham Lincoln in a speech in 1883. This was after the president had died. If you want to find out what a man is to the bottom, that is to the core, give him power. Any man can stand adversity. Only a great man can stand prosperity. It is the glory of Abraham Lincoln that he never abused power only on the side of mercy. He was a perfectly honest man. When he had power, he used it in mercy. May the same be said about all of us with respect to our money and our prosperity. Only the Spirit can help a person stand prosperity. If you were to take an honest assessment related to your heart and money, what would it be? Do you spend too much time wishing that you had more money? Or do you spend too much time thinking about how to spend the money that you already have? Are you tempted to depend on it more than you would depend on God? Consider asking him for wisdom on what you should do with the money that he's given you to steward. Do you pray before you prepare an annual budget? Do you have a budget that you use that you might steward the money that God has given you wisely and for his purposes. Worship God and not money. Trials produce joy-filled wholeness. Trials force our dependence on God. Trials affect the rich and the poor alike. And we should not view our trials as temptations towards sin, but rather as good tests from God. This is the fourth and final principle related to trials that James provides, starting in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. James offers a pronouncement of blessing similar to those that we find in the Psalms and the prophets and even Jesus' Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. This verse, James 1.12, was one of the very first verses I memorized as a Christian. And it's such a wonderful promise to a person who's facing a significant trial. It reminds us that while there might not be earthly rewards for the Christian who endures suffering, there is most certainly a heavenly reward for those who love God and endure to the end. And that reward is what James describes here as the crown of life. Another way that this can be translated is the crown that is life, everlasting life. And notice that he uses the phrase, stood the test. This is because the word for trial has two different meanings. A trial can be like a test that serves to reveal the nature or character of something or someone, much like a fire would reveal the impurities of a precious metal. But there's a second meaning to trial. And that is an attempt to make one do something wrong, a temptation, an enticement to sin. And I think this is why James uses this time 
to use the last six verses of this passage to make the case that trials are good. They are a good test from God. He's using this term to describe the first definition and not the latter. It's not a temptation or enticement to sin. Verse 13, therefore let us, oops, I'm reading from Hebrews there. Let's not do that. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire, and then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I think of James as painting a final picture here of a fork in the road. And our trials are like the fork. And the attitude that we have about our trials in relationship to God will lead us down one of two very different paths. If we believe that a trial is a good gift from God intended for our strengthening and our maturity and our wholeness and our joy, then we will look to him for wisdom and we will seek his help and his strength. This is Paul's message in 1 Corinthians 10. God will always provide a way out from under our temptation so that we don't cave to the pressures of sin. Each of us will face different trials and different temptations. And what is extremely tempting to one of us will be no issue for another. And vice versa. And so in a community of faith like this one, we need to have grace for one another in the battles that we face. And we need to commit as a congregation to flee the temptations that are appealing to us, no matter how small they might seem to us at the beginning or to anyone as they look on. And if we fall prey to our temptations that come from our desires and the enemy who brings them to us, we need to confess them to God and to one another. That's what a community of faith does. And if we stay on this path of viewing our, te- our, te- our trials as tests from God, it leads to the crown of everlasting life. But there's another path. If we view the fork as an opportunity to throw ourselves a pity party, to whine and to complain and even to blame God for tempting us, that's a totally different path. And it's a path that leads to sin stemming from our strong desire for improper things. And that desire turns to sin, which leads to death. How will we view the trials that we're facing? How will we view the trials that are coming our way that we don't even yet know about? Surely God is sovereign over all of them, but our heart attitude toward trials now will dictate which path we take. The Christian life is marked by a regular recognition that we've wandered down the wrong path and so we need to repent and cut over to the right one. But there is a decision that comes before those forks that we will face throughout our lives. And the paths that we must have settled in our hearts and minds and that is what we do about the problem of our sin. There is sin that has led to the trial oftentimes. There's sin that comes out of the trial and just our sin in general. And there is a good and perfect gift, truly the greatest gift that God has given us in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. And James closes out the passage in verse 18, reminding us of it. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his, of his creatures. God is talking about our salvation. He's writing to Christians as a Christian and he's reminding us of this new birth by God's grace. This new birth by God's grace that through faith in Christ is our only hope. In Jesus, we have the only perfect man who has ever walked this earth. He is complete. He defines wholeness in humanity. And he endured the temptations of Satan in the wilderness. And he depended fully on his heavenly father in prayer. And he followed the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He is the embodiment of God's wisdom. 
and he endured trials of his own. He endured six actual trials at the hands of his fellow Jews and Herod and Pilate. And though he was innocent, innocent, he was ultimately declared guilty. But for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy. He viewed the cross as joy. How is that possible? How can the author of Hebrews use that very language to describe the cross? He can because Jesus trusted his heavenly Father. He knew that this was what the Father was asking him to do. He knew that his death was necessary for our redemption. And so he gave his life, painfully, yes, but also joyfully, so that we too might find joy and wholeness in God, whatever comes our way, now and forevermore. And unless we receive Jesus and his gospel as a perfect gift that comes from above, the forks in the road that we face become irrelevant because we've already chosen the path. We're already marching toward death. And so it's critical for every single one of us to trust in Christ today, to be found in him by faith today. Roosevelt said that out of every crisis, every tribulation, every disaster, mankind rises with some share of greater knowledge, of higher decency, of pure purpose. And I believe this is true, but only for those who fear God and seek his wisdom. Because this is essentially what James promises us. We have no idea what sort of calamities we might face in our lifetime. But we can be certain that we will face trials of many kinds. And we must decide how we will respond to them, whether they're large or small, now. So that God might use them in our lives for our good and his glory. Because trials are a good test from him that require dependence on him so that we might find joy and wholeness in him. He's made known to us the path of life. In his presence there is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And by faith we have them all now and forever as an inheritance in Christ. Let's pray. Oh God, it's, it's hard for us to thank you for trials uh, because we don't like them. They're painful. They're hard. And yet we know that you use them to produce in us things like endurance and joy and wholeness and completeness and perfection and that when we endure them waiting for us is a crown of life, the eternal life, life with you forever, where there is fullness of joy. And so I pray for each of us now that you would help us endure the trials that are before us right now, that we would do so with joy, that we would encourage one another toward joy, that we would not settle for complaining in ourselves or one another, but we would be a community marked by joy indescribable and I pray that you would give us the wisdom that we need to endure these trials and I pray that we would link arms together as we endure them so that whatever you bring our way as a test of our faith our faith would be seen as pure and coming from you help us we pray in the name of Jesus amen